Welcome to the High Value Sales Show of Eversprint.com. I'm Malcolm Louie, the managing member of Eversprint, and today we're speaking with Matt Medeiros, the CEO of the Institute for Wealth Management, a provider of registered investment advisory services. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thanks, you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate being here. I'm looking forward to it. Matt, you grew your company's revenue from 3.5 million in 2014 to 5.6 million in 2017 a 59% increase, and in 2018, you hit around 8 million. Before we talk about how you grew your company so fast, can you briefly share what your company does beyond my quick intro and how your company differs from the competition? Absolutely. So as you mentioned earlier in the intro, we are an investment advisory firm. Um, and what, what that means to us is, is that we provide investment advisory services, which in itself doesn't sound terribly unique. Uh, but I think the approach that we take in the business is unique uh, and our value prop is, is that we're able to work with advisors who are truly acting as fiduciaries and uh, the value that we bring is trying to bring an extensive service of not just portfolio management, but financial services in the context of financial planning, um, you know, alternative investments, things of that nature that uh, they really can address all client needs. All right. Now, how would you say you differ from other uh, registered investment advisors out there? Because many of them do the same function as, as what you would do. They do. I, I think it is really kind of the independence um, that, we, that we work with with our advisors. I think a lot of advisory firms are really working hard to promote their own brand. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create partnerships with independent advisors. So these are advisors who um, really want to almost hang their own shingle and uh, use their own branding. But in partnering with us, they, they're allowed to use that branding, uh, but we will do all of the back office services or the, well, all of the things required from an investment advisory service, which is, again, which is the you know, compliance, the, the trading, the reporting, the money management, all of the back office functions. So you know, we think about it almost as a, sort of almost like a franchise model. So we're going, to, we're going to provide all of the products and services and the advisor uh, is going to actually have a very important role in uh, communicating uh, directly with the, with the client. So I think to me that is, uh, and based on the feedback that we get, that really probably is the most uh, differentiating fact between us and other advisory firms. Right. And the growth of your business reflects that as well, right? As to that model working quite well. Yeah, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're very proud of our growth. I think that we are, um, though it sounds like, um, you know, we have, we have um, uh, very exceptional growth, which, which I would say we do. I would, I would, I would say that, um, you know, our, our growth is really a, a function of um, having a great team. You right. Know, we've been very selective in who we do business with, how we do business. So, uh, there certainly shouldn't be an impression that we are taking any kind of business. I mean, for our model to work, um, we have, everybody has to be on the same page from, you know, the home office to the advisors that we work with out in the field. Right. Uh, just so that I fully understand how your business works. Now, the advisors uh, who work with you and where you provide the back office functions, are they employees of your company or are they just contracting out the back office to you? That's uh, Malik. That's another. That's another distinguishing point. Um, so it's not like just contracting out the back office. Um, they're not employees. Uh, where a lot of other advisory firms will bring on an advisor and they're uh, they they become employees. Uh, that's again another value of our firm. And, and again, a differentiating fact would be with you know a lot of the people that do business with us have left large uh, firms such as banks or wirehouse firms that you know, they themselves have become the, the value in the relationship with the client. So um, th there's really not a need for them to be an employee um, in, that, in that construct. It's just the way that the wirehouses or the banks are set up. Uh, in our business model, uh, all of the advisors that we work with are 1099. So uh, again, it gives them that flexibility as a, as a business owner to you know, create a business um, that truly is their brain. Okay. And the which the, so they're 1099 advisors and the assets of the client of their clients are held under your firm. 
Correct. We're the, we, we are the money manager. There's no question about that. Um, but they are, they are treated as, uh, as, as, I, as I sort of mentioned earlier, I think the best analogy is to think about them as, uh, uh, as, as franchise or franchisees. So, you know, we, we, we might have the McDonald's complex, but there's going to be, there might be a, a bit of a difference between, you know, the McDonald's in, in different states, for example. Right. And if they chose, the way that you have your arrangement, if they chose to uh, move the assets to another firm, like, like Charles Schwab, for example, I imagine provides similar services, right? They have an investor network of, of, of sorts that sounds a bit similar to yours, where they have investors. Yeah, I think actually, so that, that's, it's, it's, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, we do business with Charles Schwab. We also do business with TD Ameritrade, Fidelity, and, and Pershing for that matter. Um, those are those are called custodians. So the custodians are who we use to custody or um, safeguard the client assets. So uh, we do not custody any assets. So for example, if I kind of just walk you through the process of onboarding a client, the 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 it, the advisor would actually meet with the client, and those while they're together, they will open up an account at a place like a TD Ameritrade. Uh, as, a, as the custodian where the client's assets will reside. Um, our engagement is, is that at that point, the client signs an agreement saying that we would like the institute to manage our portfolio. So we would be doing the trading, making the trading decisions, the buy sell type decisions, but we do it at the custodian. Right. Got it. Now the, you said before the advisor maintains their own branding, however, right? Yes. Okay, but then I guess the account statements that their clients receive will have the Institute for Wealth Management showing on there as where their assets are being held. They will have they will have a joint brand. It'll it'll say your investment advisor is the Institute for Wealth Management. Um, your representative is Malcolm Lou. Right, I got it. And if I chose to um, move my client to another firm who uh, provides what your company does. There's no problem with that, right? If they want to do that, no stickiness involved. Um, well, we hope it's sticky. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's not like uh, you but, require them like, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I, I get your point. I yeah. think, you know, the way that we view business is that business shouldn't be something that's held hostage. Uh, it should be something that is earned. And so we, um, we believe that we will make the business sticky if we perform on our duties. Right, and, of course. But in the case where, you know, the, uh, where we have a, um, a client that thinks their needs will be best served other place, somewhere else, then uh, there is no penalty. Uh, as a matter of fact, they can hire another advisor and assuming that advisor does business with the same custodian, uh, they won't have to change the custodial paperwork. Right. Got it. Okay, cool. Again, yeah, that, like lends to part, that lends to part of the flexibility. If I, sorry to interrupt, but the, just to, it lends part of the flexibility. So if you are it, or if you are at a wirehouse firm, for example, um, you know you're you're going to have to leave that firm altogether, which means you're going to have to repaper that whole account. Which, for you know, a lot of investors, that's 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 very burdensome. Yeah, and then from what I from what I hear anecdotally, <laughs> you know, the banks and wirehouses, of course, don't want to lose the assets. So uh, yeah, it's not something that they will do uh, quickly for you either. That is, uh, that is an industry practice for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Understandable from their perspective. Now, in re and, and, and let me add, I, I do like the idea of how you provide stickiness, right? You know, you, you make it easy to leave if they really want to leave, but you provide such fantastic service that they don't want to leave to begin with, right? I mean, that's a great way to do it. I think when, you're, when you are managing other people's money, and the way that we look at it is, is um, you know, our ability and our success in managing others' money is, has a direct reflection on how they're able to run their lives in the future. So, you know, we take that responsibility very seriously. And I think that, you know, from our perspective, um, that's gotta be a two-way street. Uh, and that's why our business model works, frankly, is because we really are, we are distinguishing or almost siloing out duties. Um, you know, the duty of all of the back office uh, functionality is it is a very intensive duty uh, and it needs to be done correctly to to meet the goals of the client. But equally as important or even more important, and I, I think this is where our advisors are so successful, 
is that each client, I think even more so today than 10 years ago, is almost demanding a deeper engagement with their advisor. If you, if you think about the demographics, it is the uh, baby boomers now who are getting very close or who are already in retirement. So there is a bit of anxiety once you enter retirement of making sure that you can stay in retirement. So um, I believe that, you know, contrary to what we see in, in a lot of the a lot of the papers now where a lot of robo advisors or automatic investment advisors that are all done through the computer um, are garnering a lot of assets. I don't think that they're garnering the assets of the higher net worth or the clients who are in retirement because we, we do see that those clients are actually asking for more engagements, not less. And so that's where our advisors have been so successful. Right. Now, can you tell me, share a little bit about how you support the advisors? I know you mentioned that they have their own brand. How do you help them with their marketing? How do you help advisors find new clients and, and gain more assets? Sure. So the, one of, one of, again, one of the most important things is, is that when I say engagements, today in today's world, engagement is a, is a 24-7 process. So, you know, we may have a client who is on vacation in a different country. And they may have read a paper or just seen something that concerns them and they feel like they're out of touch with their advisor. Um, so they're, you know, the anxiety kind of builds while they're traveling. You know, one of the things that we want to do is we want to create a 24 seven experience for our clients so that they, while they're traveling, for example, um, they'll have an app where they could pull up at any time and it's completely secure. They can pull up their, their accounts, they can look at, they can do any analytics that they want to. Uh, they, can, they can look up any information if the advisor, if, if we have put out any sort of market update that is beneficial and they find timely and meaningful to them, they'll be able to pull it up on their computer or they'll be able to pull it up on their phone uh, and stay engaged on a, on a real-time basis. So First off, that's, that's a really important uh, part of the process is being available 24 seven and that helps the advisors uh, grow their businesses, again, staying engaged. Um, I think that the, you know, the second part of the, how we're helping advisors market is, is essentially providing the tools uh, and, and talking points. Uh, again, in, in engagement in our world doesn't mean you know, what's the new you know, sales pitch to sell a product because that's not what we do as a fiduciary. But uh, keeping advice, keeping clients uh, abreast to what's happening in the market. I mean, I think that the the news cycle is extraordinary these days. I mean, you can get all kinds of information, uh, both informative and contradictory at the same time. Um, what we're trying, what we do is for our advisors, we will put out a, a weekly uh, newsletter uh, that comes directly from our uh, investment committee that uh, not only updates the markets, but uh, gives them the uh, perspectives of what we see happening in the marketplace. So if by way of example, if the conversation with a client happens to be around tariffs, as an example that's happening in the news now, uh, then then you will know our, our, our position on that and you'll know our talking points on that. And you'll know uh, in, in, in real client speak, we're not trying to speak to um, the advisors at a at a level that um, you know that only investment professionals would understand. We're trying to communicate it in a way that we hope that that every investor would understand. Right. I think you know those have been some of the most popular tools. Um, you know, some of the other things that we do is you know just by just by way of the services, uh, some of the marketing tools like some of the financial planning services that we provide for our advisors, um, the engagements through our monthly. In addition to the weekly updates on the markets, we'll also do uh, uh, monthly um, webinars with our advisors to kind of, keep, again, keep them abreast and let them know what we're seeing. Um, so th those, are, those are some of the important tools. And we find that uh, from, from our business and the advisors that we work with, that if they're providing uh, information that is usable information, uh, for the client, that's the most productive way to grow your business as opposed to the sales pitch of the day. Right. How about in terms of marketing? Like, do you 
advertise for them? Do you generate leads? Do you then refer to <clears throat> advisors who are in that geography? You know, how do you help them grow their business beyond giving them the tools that they can use to uh, engage their, their prospects and current clients? You know, Malk, that's a, it's an interesting question. Um, and candidly, I would tell you that almost all of the business that our advisors have, so thus the business that, that we have, is, is referral business. And I think that's the smartest way to grow your business. So, um, you know, again, I don't want to oversimplify it, but reality is, is that it, it really isn't that difficult. If you're staying in front of your clients and you are uh, keeping them, I don't know, I don't want to say just, you know, abreast to, to, of the market, but also if you, are, if you are staying top of mind with your clients, you're going to be getting referrals. And that's, that's, that's I, 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 from my perspective, there is no sort of magic pill uh, for this. Um, you know, I don't really see a lot of, in my, again, this is, this is our opinion, uh, a lot of sort of mass marketing strategies that are effective in, in um, communicating fiduciary services. I think those type of, you know, marketing strategies are productive for, you know, product sales but that's not the type of clients that uh, our advisors are working with. Right. Okay. What do you think about Fisher Investments? Those guys are spending significant sums of money on uh, pay-per-click advertising uh, from the data that I have. Um, and, 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 you know, I checked out their funnel just, just uh, the other day, right? That, you mm -hmm. know, people are searching for uh, a retirement annuities. Uh, there is an ad from Fisher there. If you click on it, it uh, takes you to a page that talks about retirement annuities. There's a download for people to opt in uh, to receive that book. And I opted in, right? And they asked for all the keys yeah. that one needs, that they need, right? My name, my address, uh, you know, what my assets are, you know, am I interested in having a consultation with them and so on, right? So, you know, I see what they're doing. And, uh, you know, Fisher, as you know, is huge, right? They're the 10,000 pound gorilla <laughs> in the space, yes. right? Yes. And, uh, you know, their account size is, aren't trivial either, right? I mean, they're saying, you know, if your account size is over 500,000, you know, we can do a consultation to see if we can help you, right? So, I mean, they're looking for larger accounts as well. So what's your take on what they are doing as opposed to what you just shared with me about just doing re referral marketing based? You know, first off, I would say it's impressive. Um, you know, I, I often get mailed to my house, uh, you know, a, a Fisher advertisement and, um, you know, for a firm like ours that is working very hard to provide efficient services at a very good price for the for the clients, um, it's certainly not on, on our budget to have that kind of marketing strategy. I think that that type of marketing strategy is um, is is really more of a brand awareness strategy, which I think you know in business you have to do, and I think uh, they've done a fantastic job doing that. I think the Fisher Company has done a great job in uh, positioning um, thoughts and some thought leadership. I, but I, from my perspective, and that, and that might get you some opportunities, but at the end of the day, um, you know, what we're looking at is developing long-term relationships. And generally those long-term relationships come from referrals. People want to do business and want to refer business to people that they like and that they right. can trust. And, you know, I think, um, uh, just by having an advertisement on television, uh, it doesn't it doesn't build trust. And so, um, again, we're you know I you know maybe someday we'll be a size of a Fisher, but that's certainly not our business aspiration and goals. Right. Got it. So it sounds like um, the advisors you bring on board they, they they have a pretty significant book of business. Right. They're not like the the young Edward Jones folks who are building the book and literally knock door to door in the neighborhood, right? Yeah, that's, you know, um, that, that's correct. I, our, our advisors are generally advisors that have been in the business for, you know, an average of 10 years plus. Um, you know, they, they, they're, they're, knocking, they're not knocking on doors. They may have done that to start, I don't know, but they've developed good long-term relationships. You know, some of our advisors have had, um, you know, relationships with clients that are, you know, 20, 25 years long. And so it's, it's, it's wonderful when I get to work with the advisor and I get to meet some of their clients and, you know, they talk about, you know, the weddings and the, 
you know, the celebrations and, and things of that nature that they have shared over the years. Uh, and when you get to that point, it's, it's, it's really uh, not about, you know, who's, who's got the best commercial on television. You know, right. it, it really is who's going to be part of my family. And that's and to, to us, uh, that is the best way to build your business. And um, so I, I would say that the, the, the bulk of our guys have been in the business considerably longer uh, than, than, you know, your average uh, Edward Jones uh, advisor. Um, and, you know, they have a, what we refer to as a book of business. So they already have a, a clientele that, uh, you know, that they have established over years. Most of them would like to grow that clientele. Uh, and the reason that they're again attracted to us is the is the is the perspective and you know actuality that they're going to be able to deepen those relationships by providing more thoughtful services for those clients. Right. Now I I do have a question for you about how you bring advisors into the Institute for Wealth Management fold. But before then, maybe uh, we can get take a bigger picture view. You you grew your business pretty fast, 3.5 million in 2014. And you more than doubled it four years later, right? 2018, you're around $8 million. And I, and, I, and I believe you already touched on this, but let's uh, maybe recap again. What were the biggest drivers of that growth over the past four years? If I focus just on the last four years, I would tell you that the difference in business is, um, you know, if we go all the way back, I, I started the business in 2003. And when I started the business initially, we were just a money management firm. So we didn't have direct engagements with advisors. What we would do is we would work with brokerage firms, um, like some of the ones that I've mentioned earlier in this conversation. We would work with them, but we would, we would be approaching the firms at the firm level just as an asset manager. And so that's, that, that, that's how we started the business and we ran it that way for the good, for the first I don't know, good to well, 13 years. And then we made the strategic decision because over the course of years, we would continue to get referrals from advisors, referrals um, to advisors that uh, wanted to go independent. And we really, you know, that just wasn't our business model. And, um, you know, we wanted to help those individuals. So, or work with those individuals. So, um, we, what we did about four years ago is we decided to continue to, do, to work with our, you know, asset manager only model. But again, now uh, allow those, those advisors that wanted to break away, as we say, because, uh, you know, whether you know this or not, there's a, there's a, there's a dramatic trend in the industry for uh, traditional um, wirehouse and bank Again, I, 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 brokers is really what they what they are. So brokers um, leaving leaving the brokerage firms and wanting to go independent in one way, shape, or form. So that's sort of been the trend now for, you know, I would say you know almost going on ten years. Um, and so with that trend, we're getting referrals to those advisors, and we would kind of say, look, once you get your things set up, we can help you. And so four years ago, we decided to say, well, why don't we just help you get that set up? Um, and, you know, work together to put this together and we'll continue working with your clients at that point. So I, I would say that the, that the, 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 the reason we were able to do that was um, just a combination of our business strategy. And as we continue to grow our business, um, you know, just continue to be thoughtful, but most importantly, have our, our, our finger on the pulse of the trends in the industry where you know advisors are looking to provide better services for their clients and not necessarily their brokerage firms. Right. So, so the number one driver is that you identified the trend of advisors at the brokerages at the wirehouses wanting to go independent, and you saw an opportunity as to how you can help them go independent, and at the same time, um, you know, make it easier for them to maintain the relationship with their clients and still provide the same services as they were getting when they were at the brokerages. That's correct. Okay. Um, were there, so, um, so number one would be, you know, capitalizing on that trend. Is there uh, two other drivers of your business? Well, I, th I think as we mentioned before, I mean, understanding, if, if you think about it, the, the advantage that, you know, working with a firm that uh, is the size of some of these large wirehouses 
is that there's unlimited resources. You know, I, I don't mean just money. I mean, there's lots of money, of course, but un unlimited resources, uh, meaning that you're going to have a lot of uh, inv a lot of different investment options uh, and a lot of different ways that you can hopefully um, satisfy the client's investment objectives. Um, again, the challenge is is that in those so so and and I guess what advisors get frustrated with is um, the firm, uh, the wirehouse in this case, telling the uh, advisor what they should be putting in the client accounts. So I, I think the, you know, for us, the, the, the second driver of the business was essentially um, expanding the services so that we can essentially um, be a resource rich firm like the wirehouses, but provide the independence. So for whatever financial product the advisors may need to help their clients, uh, your firm for the most part has that available. We have that available and um, continuing to, again, work with our, our advisors and their clients to understand, you know, what types of things in the future uh, that, that we don't have that we should be thinking about so that we can be innovative as well. Right. Uh, you know, it, again, that's, that's critically important. I mean, we want to make sure that, um, you know, not only uh, are you getting the services and the treatment as you are with the, wire, with, with the large wirehouse firm, um, but you, you also get the benefit of working with a firm that is much smaller and nimble and able to make decisions. Right. You know, there's, there's, there's lots of business things that change, the business uh, models that change. There's, there's regulatory things that change. There's markets that change. So we believe we're in a much better position to uh, adapt to those changes than, you know, the big, the, big, uh, the big firms that just say, well, let's just wait it out and wait till the market comes back to us. Right. Now, the, the, the big banks, um, for sure, they have the balance sheet and the people and the resources to you know, create their products in-house and offer it, right? You know, structured products and so on. How does your firm handle that? You, you partner up with other banks to co-sell, co-originate some product for your clients? We do. Uh, and again, that's the, that's, for us, that's the advantage, as, as, as sort of you alluded to, if I'm, if I'm an advisor or if I'm a broker, pardon me, if I'm a broker with a wirehouse, um, you know, if I needed a structured product, for, for example, I'm, I'm getting my firm structured product. Uh, for, but because of uh, how we've set up our business and, and, you know, what we were doing first starting off as an asset manager, we have deep relationships in some of the largest uh, banks, you know, in the world. And so what this enables us to do is actually create structures that we think are most advantageous for our clients and then go to multiple banks to get the best pricing uh, for our clients. Right. Yeah, I can see how that could be advantageous. Right? It meets the client's needs better as opposed to saying, what well, this is all we got. <laughs> you know, and it's not. really more of a, it's, it's, it's really much more bespoke for the client as opposed to, you know, a, a bank creating a product and saying, I need this many clients and this much money in it by the end of the month. I mean, yeah. there's, there's nothing in that, that that sounds like it's in the best interest of the client. Right. Would the pricing of your products be competitive still, given that it's more bespoke? Well, I, th I think it's not like competitive. I think it's, it's, uh, um, it, it's way advantageous than doing it in some of the other, than uh, our, our price is more advantageous than, than working with some of these, these bigger firms, because as you can imagine, um, they got a lot more people to feed. <laughs> yeah. You know, tens of thousands more. And, and we work one way. We, we only work on the fees that our clients pay us. And so there's no commissions to help out with, a, you know, with anything else. Um, you know, that's, that's how we make money. And so if our client's happy, uh, we continue to have a job. If they're not happy, then we get terminated and we don't have a job anymore. Right. So, you know, it's, it, it, it's a very high incentive for us to do a good job for our clients. Yep. And, and uh, going back to the beginning of the interview, and I think you might have perhaps mentioned the third driver of your success. You mentioned how you're very selective with the advisors you work with. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, it, it, and that's, it's, it's very interesting because it's, um, there's obviously not a, a you know, criteria, sort of a form criteria for that. There really has to be, um, you know, just like our, I mentioned earlier that we, that our advisors have deep relationships and engagements with our clients, with their clients, <coughs> excuse me, 
um, we are going to be working day to day, hand in hand with that advisor and most often that advisor's back office. And so we need to make sure for, for everybody's sake that we have some, um, some, some cultural matches uh, so that, you know, we have the same beliefs and the same philosophies and, you know, we treat clients the same because, you know, I believe that if you, you know, you're going to treat your clients the way you treat each other. Yeah. And so, you know, if, if there, if there's a disconnect in that, in the relationship, um, you know, Malka, I want to tell you, we probably passed up on twice as much business as we have right now. Right. And it's not to say that there are bad people. We just had different philosophies. Yep. Now, how do you figure this out that you guys are a fit? Because what you mentioned are very soft skills, soft things, right? It's not quantifiable. Um, very, very, uh, I'm sure there was a financial firm that said this before me, but uh, we do it the old fashioned way. I got to spend time with you. I got to meet you. How long do you, how long is the typical process before you will say, yeah, let's, let's uh, bring you on board on our platform from beginning to end. It's, it's, uh, it, 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 it's kind of like, you know, how long, what's the proper time to wait before you get married? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know, and sometimes it takes a little bit longer, Okay. Uh, you know, and, and you know, we don't want advisors to make these decisions lightly because for it to be beneficial, not just for their clients, but for them and for us, these are long-term relationships we're talking about. These aren't transactions. Yep. So, you know, that kind of goes back to our, you know, kind of our marketing strategy and referrals. Um, you know, these aren't things that you can build overnight. You can't build a reputation overnight. So we, uh, you know, we, we, will, we will spend as much time as we need to um, going through the business with the advisor, uh, going through philosophies and cultures, going through financials. You know, we want to make sure that it's also financially beneficial, not just for our firm, but for the advisor that we're talking to. So there's a, there's a variety of different things that we go through before we can make that decision. Uh, but uh, you know, the decisions that we, that we do make, um, you know, I would say for the most part, um, have been very successful because we were, we, we take the time, we, we take the time we need to, to, to uh, be comfortable in our decisions. Right. Uh, can you give me a range of how long it takes? Are, are you talking weeks, months, years? No. Um, I would say that if, if it takes years, I'm, I'm up to the challenge. <laughs> you know, we're not going anywhere. Yeah. As I think you said earlier, uh, you know, based upon our progress. Um, so that I'm fine with, um, you know, it could take, it could take a few weeks too. Right. Okay. Yeah. Case by case. Totally understand that. It, it really is. And, and that's how we've, that's how we've grown our businesses case by case. Right. Now for uh, 2019, uh, what are your plans? What are your challenges? What obstacles does your team need to overcome to hit your targets? And what are your targets? Um, well, first off, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if you consider this a soft target or not, but, um, you know, we're always looking at how we can improve and, and, you know, we're very fortunate to be in an industry, you know, that being the financial industry, that there is always ways for improvement, improvement and how you did things 10 years ago. If you're doing the way the business the same way today, then, um, you know, you're, you're on a, on a fast track to exist and there's to, um, uh, irrelevance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. So we, um, um, you know, one of our big pushes is uh, a new tech, what we call a tech stack. So we are implementing new technology um, to not only help us more efficiently run the business, but also, um, you know, provide more value to our clients with some of the look and feel tools, um, you know, providing more future tools, um, you know, being able to, you know, get our tech stack um, talking so that we have, you know, we have a tremendous amount of information and a tremendous amount of clients. And so what we're also trying to do is we're trying to um, look at some predictive analytics with our technology so that um, we can generalize with, our, with, with uh, the clients that we have, um, we can generalize some of their needs prior to them needing. It. So for example, um, as clients are nearing retirement or perhaps in retirement, if they, you know, if they have a certain net worth, they might have some, you know, estate trust things so that we can or tr trust needs that, you know, maybe we can talk to them in advance 
um, at, at, or, or give them some useful information to um, begin a conversation. Uh, somebody with, you know, less, less, uh, uh, less of a um, uh, value or less, less of a portfolio value, um, you know, there may be different issues. So, you know, trying to get some predictive analytics so that we can, you know, help our clients navigate the future before, uh, before we get there. Because that's yep. always the best, the best way to be successful in the financial industry is anticipate things as opposed to react to everything. Yeah, oh, it's always good to have a plan, right? Otherwise, you're kind of floundering around. So I said. Yeah. So I think I think back to your question, Malcolm. I think the first thing is is um, you know, frankly, the um, the technology. You know, and I know that's really not super quantifiable, but as you can imagine, um, with any firm, but uh, you know, the, the to the to the length and depth of what we're doing on the technology side. Uh, it, it's quite an ordeal, and I'm, you know, I, the clients are going to be, and advisors for that matter, are going to be very excited about it. Yeah, makes life easier, and and makes them get a, you know, results that they are desiring that they want faster. Now, exactly. you, now, how about revenue targets? Can you, are you comfortable sharing what sort of revenue growth you're looking for? Well, I mean, I'd like to say that we're going to continue our revenue patterns that we have before, um, but candidly. Um, you know, for this year, we have um, almost neutralized a bit of our our growth, um, just to make sure that we are dedicating as much resources that we can to the um, technology implementation. Um, you know, it's it's important for us to make sure that we have a firm foundation of our business, and so you know, we don't want to we don't want to add on a whole lot of new business that we aren't able to support in the manner in which that we have uh, become accustomed to um, if, if we're dedicating more resources to something else. And, and, and again, right now, we are, our team has been diligently dedicating themselves on, uh, on the technology. So, um, you know, I'd be hesitant to kind of give you a, uh, a revenue projection because I, um, we certainly want to continue to grow the business. Uh, we've, we, we have a, um, a, a tremendous pipeline of opportunity right now. Uh, but that pipeline is kind of being, um, I don't want to say put on hold, but this sort of, uh, nurtured, if you will, right now until we're comfortable adding on to the infrastructure. Right. Now, when you mean pipeline, you're talking about pipeline of new advisors who want to join your platform. That's the primary growth factor here. <laughs> That is our driver right now, yes. Okay, and it's not so much as, as, your, as the asset management side of your business of just accumulating more assets of your own as opposed to through a 1099 advisor. Well, that's, I mean, they, they kind of they feed into the same. So that 1099 advisor, you know, using our, our, our portfolios builds our asset management. But, um, right. but that is exactly what I'm referring to, advisors that want to move over. Right. Uh, you know, and so we are, uh, we're, we are, um, making sure that we are not just continuing conversations, but certainly uh, keeping them abreast of what we're doing so that they know exactly what we're doing and not dragging our feet because of them. But, yep. um, you know, onboarding new advisors is a, is, is, is a tremendous um, uh, endeavor. You know, it takes a lot of, a lot of communication. It takes a lot of effort, and a lot of focus to do it properly because you don't want to, disrupt a client relationship. Yep. So we want this for the advisor to be a very, very smooth transition. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have the support of custodians, <coughs> excuse me, that are uh, very helpful with us and our advisors to, uh, you know, to help with this business transition. And, you know, so that, that, that collective effort is not something that we take lightly. So um, I think the advisors that we, that, that are in our pipeline, that kind of also builds a bond with them to let them know that, you know, your business is really important to us and we don't want to hurt your business. So we're going to wait. I'm not saying that would hurt it, but we, we want to wait until our, our tech uh, is completed and then, um, and, and then bring it on. So I think that helps build the bond as well with the advisor. Yeah, definitely. But are they going to stick around? That's, you know, um, again, that's the, 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 the beauty and crux of, that it's an at will business. Yep. So, um, you know, if we are the best solution for them, then, and again, I'm, and I'm, I'm hoping that the people that work with us are thinking 
uh, what's best for their business long term, you know, not what's best for the business next month, mm -hmm. uh, then I believe they'll be around. Uh, right. You know, and part of them being around is obviously being honest and upfront with them. And we've definitely done that. Yep. So um, my hope is, is that we don't, uh, you know, lose them to a competitor, but um, it, it's the, the alternative is not worth, it's not worth the risk. Yep. I hear you. So how do you get these guys into your pipeline to begin with? Yeah, I, I, I wish I could tell you that we had the secret proprietary sauce. <laughs> you know, we can't tell anybody, but honestly, it's the old fashioned way. It's, it's referrals. Um, you know, we've, we've been in this business a long time. We do what we say we're going to do. Um, and we don't do, we don't do any less than that. And, uh, uh, I think people that have done business with business with us over time appreciate that. And, uh, you know, this is, it, it's interesting. It's a, it's a huge business, but a small community. Yep. So, you know, everybody kind of talks and, um, so, you know, we, we, we have a very good reputation and, you know, we work hard, uh, for our guys and I think that's how we get the referrals. Right. And so the referrals are coming from your other, from your current uh, investment advisors who are working with you now. They are advising their buddies to consider moving over to your platform. That, that's one of the, that's one of the best sources for us. The other sources are the, you know, financial firms that we do business with. They're, they're touching investment professionals around the country all the time. Yep. Um, and, you know, we, we have good relationships with them as well. And, um, you know, if we're a right fit, then, then, you know, hopefully we'll get a, we'll get a referral. Right. Got it. Three final questions for you, Matt. Sure. If you were to have a billboard somewhere, uh, wh whether it be in your hometown or perhaps in an another market where you want to increase your presence, what would be your billboard message? And keep in mind that most people only have about six seconds before they drive by a billboard. Yeah, I, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I would probably say, how important is your future? Now you're obviously, uh, this that's my off the cuff and, and, you know, from, from, um, that, you know, the, the, there might be a subtext to that that says, you know, are you working with a financial professional that has your interest in mind or you're interested or at your interest first? Right. Your you interest know, first is a good one. You, you probably know, and are, you're certainly much better at the marketing side than, than I, but um, to me, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we take managing money very seriously, which I hope everybody does. But, uh, you know, for us, it's, 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 not a, it's, not, it's not a billboard thing where, you know, we expect you to, um, that we expect you to pick up the phone and, and take an action. We, 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 want, we want to already create the action. We want the action to be, um, I want you to think about this. Don't, your, your future shouldn't be arbitrary. It shouldn't be, um, it, it, it shouldn't be something that you hope happens. Um, it should be something that's planned and so that you understand what the expectations are. And that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to, hopefully in some way on that billboard, we would communicate, um, in a, in a way that somebody would say, it's time for me to take notice of my future and call someone who's working with me, um, not trying to sell me something. Right. But people really don't know your company so much as a, as an asset manager, right? So, so maybe the billboard should be geared toward the advisors to come onto your platform. Yeah. Then, then if it's geared toward the advisors, you know, I would say something as an investment professional, wouldn't you rather work for your client? And, and that, and, you know, again, that's, that's, uh, for people who want to really examine the question, it really is thinking, you know, did I, did I do, did I, in my work or my engagement with that client, did I do what was in their best interest or did I do what was in the firm's best interest? And, um, those don't always line up. I mean, I think the DOL was trying to, um, Department of Labor was trying to um, trying to get some clarity around this because I mean that's the whole point of the fiduciary rule, the RIA, which the Institute for Wealth Management is an RIA, which means that we are a fiduciary, which means our objective and our our obligation is to work in the what's in the best interest of the client. Yep. Uh, and conversely, um, a broker 
which again, most, most clients don't know the difference between a advisor, but a broker is able to sell a client anything they're qualified and there's a big difference there. Yep. And I'm not sure, and I think the, the Department of Labor would clarify that difference, um, which, which again has been um, something that I think is interesting in our, in our space. Um, I, hope, I don't know how it's going to take hold in the future, but uh, I do know that many clients don't know the difference between a broker and a fiduciary. Um, I've seen some advertisements lately that are starting to hit that point. Um, but I, I just don't know if, uh, if that's really being paid attention as much as it should. But, um, you know, we, we, we are pushing that point and we're, we're the, the advisors that we bring on that are breaking away from a, from a wirehouse or large bank or something of that nature, um, generally speaking, are saying, look, I can't, I can't wear those two hats. Yep. I either need to work on what's best interest of the client or the best interest of the firm. Yep. Um, so that's, that's, uh, hopefully in some way we, we would be able to communicate, you know, again, with, with much smarter marketing people like yourself, you know, that, that, that message in a, in a short six second soundbite. Yeah. Well, we can work on that. I think fiduciary, if you ask the common person out there, what does that mean? I think that's a tough question for the, for them to answer. Well, I, you know, I, I, the way that I, I, and, and part of it comes from, from us. I mean, you know, we're the stewards of this industry. So, you know, what we have to do as an industry is we have to say, look, you people become advisors uh, because, not because they want to sell financial services, but because they want to work as a intermediary, if you will, representing the client. So I don't think any of us would want to go into court and be our own lawyer. So you're, gonna, you're going to get a lawyer because that lawyer knows the laws and is licensed to be a lawyer. Um, in the advisory business, and, and, and that lawyer is representing just you. Yeah. Uh, in the advisory business, it's, it's similar in the sense that when you pass your exam as an advisor, not as a broker, but as an advisor, again, your obligation is to go to the markets and say, what are the best products and services to suit my client's needs before, excuse me, after you have already gathered the client's information so you know what their needs are? Yep. Yeah, that's probably something we can work with uh, for your billboard message. Best products and services to, to suit your client's needs. Yeah. Tighten, tighten, that, tighten that down a little bit. You bet, you bet. Yeah. But that's, again, that's what, I would, that's what I would like to communicate. And I think it's, um, um, I, I, I don't, we'll, I, we'll have to find out if that resonates with the consumer. Um, because at this point, I would say the consumers don't know the difference between a broker and a fiduciary. No, I don't think they do either. So. And, and plus, there are no TV shows about uh, fiduciary drama, unlike the law profession. <laughs> so. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so the last two questions I have for you. Who are your ideal advisors, and what's the best way for them to contact your company and your team? Sure. Uh, so I would say the ideal advisor, as I mentioned earlier, somebody who's got a little bit of history in the business, um, you know, that's been, that's, that's, that's um, you know, has, has a client, a book of business that they are already managing, they're working on. Um, generally speaking, you know, for us, the average advisor would be about $40 million under management. And, um, you know, that, that is going to range, um, you know, the number of households that they represent is going to range. So that's, that's a little bit harder to determine, but about 40 million under management. Uh, you know, we have some guys that have 10 million. Um, but the other part of it is, is that regardless if it's 10 or, uh, or 40, you know, for us, the ideal advisor is somebody who's engaged with their clients, not just someone who's, you know, getting a new client and then doesn't anticipate seeing that client for a couple of years or until the client has a problem. Right. Uh, so, you know, we get into that engagement part. Right. Um, is there an average account size that you're looking for that these, ad, that these advisors have with their clients? Currently, our, our uh, average account size as a, as a firm level is about $300,000. Okay. Um, for, but we have clients, we, excuse me, we have advisors that their book of business is representative of clients that are, you know, probably a, a, a median, uh, account size of 170,000. And yep. we also have advisors, uh, with us that, uh, the median account size is over two and a half million. Yep. All right. It's, it's, uh, and again, 
that speaks very well to our who our clients and who our business is. Because again, the you know the 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 client that has a three hundred thousand dollars to live off for the rest of their life shouldn't be getting less service than the client who has three million or five million or ten million. Yeah. So we've built our business um, for that's for for exactly that. Right. And the best way for them to contact your team? The best way is to, uh, is to call us. Um, we're at um, 303-572-3500. Uh, you're welcome to talk to me directly. My extension is 3185. Uh, our email address, excuse me, our, our, uh, my email address, I'm sorry, is Matt, M-M-A-T-T-M, at Institute4, that's F-O-R, wealth.com, Matt M at instituteforwealth.com. Uh, and certainly check out our website, uh, it, which is uh, instituteforwealth.com. So love to hear anybody who's out there um, looking to understand how an, uh, how an independent professional might work in the space um, or actually just partnering with a good team that uh, can help them grow their business for the future. All right. Matt, it's been awesome having you on my show today. I really enjoyed hearing how you grew your company so fast. It's been a pleasure. I'm always excited to talk about the industry and the business and uh, appreciate the opportunity to visit with you. We've been speaking with Matt Medeiros, the CEO of the Institute for Wealth Management, about his company's rapid growth. For interviews with other fast-growing, high-value sales companies, or to learn how we can accelerate your firm's high-value sales through automation, visit Eversprint.com.